The meeting is called to order at 6.31 p.m. Please rise and the clerk will lead us in the pledge. To the flag of the Can I please have a motion and a second that the board approves the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Board members, questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed? Emily, you just have to do the main agenda first and then the oh, I don't see it. Oh. Our agenda before the other consent, oh. yep. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see it. I see it. I'm sorry. Thank you. Can I have a motion and a second that the agenda of December 12th, 2023 be approved as submitted? So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Thank you. I always skip that. Can I please have a motion and a second that the treasurer's report, including the cash report, general fund cash report, the general fund revenue status report, general fund budget status report, school lunch fund cash report, and school lunch fund revenue and expense budget report for the month ending September 30th, 2023 be approved. So moved. Second. Um, questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed? Special reports. We have uh, one very special report. It is our annual Medicaid compliance plan recertification. So we have our world famous Marty Morrow here, mm -hmm. <laughs> and your slides are all set up, and um, uh, the clicker should work for you. So I struggle with these. So do I need to push this? Can you hear me? I think me you're okay? good. Nope, it's on. Perfect. And then do you have a clicker? Yes, I do. Just make sure. Okay. So, awesome. Uh, there you go. Thank you for inviting me here tonight. I'm Marty Morrow, the Medicaid coordinator for Penfield, and I'm just going to give you a refresher on Medicaid in Penfield. SSHSP is the supportive, school supportive health services program, otherwise known as Medicaid in education. So this is the New York State program that enables our district to access federal monies for students who are Medicaid eligible, who are, um, uh, have medically necessary, medically necessary related services on their IEP. We have a Medicaid compliance committee in Penfield that consists of Scott Dreschler, the Department of Special Ed, um, Director of Special Ed, Bill Maloney, who is the school business executive, and myself. We review the quarterly, we have quarterly meetings to review alerts um, from Medicaid, notices that they send out and changes, updates that they have. We establish best practices and procedures and annually review our compliance plan. The compliance agreement is provided to you to disclose any um, information regarding waste, fraud, or abuse. So you have the information. If you have any concerns, please reach out. Scott Dreschler is our compliance <coughs> officer. Or you can reach out to the Office of the Medicaid Inspector General in Albany. The Medicaid billable services are listed in front of you, and these are all really designed to be managed through like doctor's offices, the way the documentation is handled. And so a lot of it is um, a lot of documentation that we don't process uh, in the same way. So we really bill for the speech 
OT and PT services because that's most efficient in submitting our claims. The first thing we have to obtain is a parental consent for any students who are eligible. Parents give us permission to uh, access their students' public benefits. So we can submit claims for them. It's a one-time consent and it allows us to be reimbursed for services that are medically eligible. Individuals who order, prescribe, refer, or attend services through this program have to be enrolled. It's a five-year term. It's basically to update information about the provider so that um, the program can reach them or um, make sure that all their information is up to date. The different provider qualifications, a speech language pathologist, physical therapist, and occupational therapist, all have to be licensed and certified through New York State with an NPI number. And um, if they aren't, they could be a teacher of speech, hearing, and handicapped, or a teacher of students with speech and language disabilities under the direction of a speech therapist. And for PT and OT, they could be an assistant for those therapies under the direction of a certified licensed therapist. The National Provider Identifier is a federal database for agencies that are covered by HIPAA and um, it is really just a way to keep track of providers nationally. So we can look them up and be sure that we have up-to-date information for those providers and they are up, you know, up and up not in any um, default, basically. There's also a regulation on exclusion. So anytime there's a new provider that's working with our children, we can look them up in a database to see if they have been excluded for fraud or abuse or any other um, issue or concern. And I, I look those up and we have another person in HR who looks them up as well. We have partnerships for, um, like Mary Cariola, who will sign an annual agreement with us allows us to submit claims for their services and they have a statement of reassignment which basically means they won't also bill for the same services so no one's double dipping. These are the requirements for Medicaid claims. Students have to be eligible for Medicaid. We have the one-time parental consent. The qualified prescriber has to have all the enrollments that are needed. They have, the student has to have a service on their IEP. The uh, referral, or referral or order has to be from a qualified provider. The service provider has to enter notes within a certain time frame of the actual date of service. And it has to follow certain guidelines. The sessions have to meet the IEP requirements. There is a CPT code, which is a code that applies to the type of service being provided during that session. And then there's a ICD-10 code, which is a code that applies to their diagnosis, their medical condition. And so with all that in included, um, we process our claims through Frontline, which has all kinds of audits it, within their logic, and it helps us not to bill for anything that's not eligible. So then we have a cost report at the end of the year, and that includes a random moments time study, which is exactly what it says. The state sends out random emails to our providers and asks what they are doing at that moment in time. And the providers have two school days to respond. And it's really just to make sure that we're, you know, identifying people who are actually working in our district when we say that they are. Trying to keep everybody on the straight and narrow. <laughs> um, so it's an annual report that consists of a count of all students who are receiving Medicaid eligible services. It also keeps track of anyone that's on our payroll that, as a provider and their benefits. 
and it also um, keeps track of the supplemental list of any agencies that we work with, including BOCES, so that we can make sure that all of those people that are working with our students all have the proper certifications. And of course, administrative costs. We have a couple documentation audits. One is through BOCES, and that's usually every couple of years. And the other is through EFPR group with in internally with our district. Any questions? Board members questions? I have a question. Sure. Marty, I'm just curious, um, <coughs> when you spoke about the exclusions, like if there was, a st has there ever been a situation where there was fraud with a family wanting Medicaid, care or Medicaid, but then actually was qualified for it, where does the state deny that if they once were fraudulent, but then they're actually able to, like they have a need like reinstate? to reinstate? Yeah, do they reinstate? Better word, thank you. I'm not aware of that. Okay, I was just curious if. Yeah, I don't believe happened. so. Okay, thank you. Uh, you had mentioned BOCES, and, uh, and actually that um, was a question I had. So when we have students that are placed in BOCES or gets BOCES services, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know if those services are, are billable to Medicaid or if they're coordinating. How does that work when we partner with BOCES on caring for a student? What was that last part of the question? How does that work when we partner with BOCES yes. on caring for a student as far as who's billing the who's doing the Medicaid billing, who's coordinating that? Yeah, so it goes through our four... For the students that are placed out of district through BOCES, they, um, their notes on services that they provide to their students actually filter into our system so that we can submit for those costs. So um, again, only if the student is Medicaid eligible. Mm -hmm. And for any providers that are BOCES provided services within district it's similar but they they actually enter their sessions into our system and we manage those the same way BOCES would only all of that is really filled through us BOCES does not bill for that great because they're state funded yeah thank you any other questions I should have a comment and I don't know if it's a question but um your presentation was very clear and concise, and you made it sound pretty simple, <laughs> step by step. And I know that is not yeah. what really goes on. So um, thank you for going through all of this paperwork and all these steps and processes, because we know the state doesn't make it easy to um, support our children You're sometimes. Yeah. Are they watching? <laughs> um, but yeah. Thank you for your, your, um, your accuracy and your diligence and for making it look easy when <laughs> we know it's not. Thank you. Thank you. And you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Marty. You're welcome. Thanks, Marty. Thanks, Marty. Have a good night. Thank you. You, you, too. you too. Thanks. That concludes superintendent. Or nope, it doesn't. That includes special reports. <laughs> hey, Helen, you are up. Student reports or student rep. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, in terms of district-wide updates, um, I'm sure you all know that many Jewish students and staff celebrated the first night of Hanukkah on December 7th. Um, at PHS, today we had our monthly community building day. Uh, so after we competed in a rock, paper, scissors tournament for an icebreaker, we discussed inclusivity and unity. Uh, last night was the Junior Winter Concert, where many groups, including the Philharmonia Orchestra, concert band, and concert choir performed. Auditions for the spring musical Music Man are in progress, and boys swimming, girls basketball, and our bowling team are all having great seasons so far. At Bay Trail, Pen Prince, the school's literary magazine, is accepting submissions for its December contest, and its theme is Holiday Cheer. On Wednesday, December 20th, Rock Therapy Dogs will be visiting during lunch periods. And next week is Spirit Week, and students and staff are so excited to show their school pride with themed dress-up days, the first being Media Monday. At Scribner, their winter concert is happening tomorrow night. At Cobbles, their winter concert is happening Thursday night. 
and until the 22nd, they are holding a hat and mitten drive, and students are encouraged to donate new or lightly used winter hats, gloves, and scarves. At Indian Landing, the winter concert is happening tonight, I believe maybe in the auditorium. Um, and at Harris Hill, their winter concert is happening Monday night, and every Wednesday in December will be a Harris Hill pizza night at Cam's Pizzeria. So if any of you are pizza inclined, uh, you can <laughs> mention the Harris Hill fundraiser when you order, and a portion of the proceeds will go to the PTA to support Harris Hill. Good. Thank you, Helen. Superintendent reports. Helen, you always do such a nice job. Mm -hmm. Typically when you talk, I, I have an idea of what's happening because mm -hmm. I also work here. But you, <laughs> you got me with the pizza night, so you have no idea how excited I am for tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> Big fan. Um, thank you. I have for superintendent reports, uh, just two. Oh, we just, I just have uh, two uh, uh, staff student honors, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Driffel for our business updates for this evening. Um, for me, the first is our scholar athlete teams, and you'll hear uh, me uh, provide these honors typically a couple times a year after every season. Uh, but this one's pretty cool. It's a congratulations to every single one of our fall sports teams on being named. Um, I always have to remember this long one. So it's, it's the New York State Public High School Athletic Association Scholar Athlete Teams. So in order to qualify for this honor, which is across the state, the team's average for 75% of the roster must be 90% or higher. And so uh, this is all of our fall teams with boys and girls cross country, field hockey, football, <coughs> game day cheer, girls golf, gymnastic, boys and girls soccer, girls swimming and diving, girls tennis, and boys and girls volleyball. And I, we always talk about it, especially with um, our athletic director, Mary Beth Walker, the, the reality is that we are student athletes here so they're they're not professional athletes um, and uh, they are students first and so these are the honors that are pretty cool that we do pretty well on on our competition fields and pools um, but we also um, you know bring a strong academic program uh, for our athletes and second um, there's a list of 50 incredible phs students which is early recognition black scholars so congratulations to the 50 phs students who've been named early recognition black scholars by the urban league of rochester and all those names are in the agenda um, i think our board will probably recognize three of them so um, thank you for raising great kids and uh and we appreciate it here in penfield and I'll turn it over to Dr. Driffel for business updates. All right. Thanks, Dr. Putnam. Um, <clears throat> good evening, board. My updates aren't as uh, brief, so we got a, a few things we got to get through tonight. Um, four things for board approval, uh, and then just one item for review. Um, so first, we have two um, capital project change orders, so contractor amendments um, related to the roofing work that's been going on at Bay Trail and Scribner. Um, so one of those was for drainage improvements and one of those was to remove some old um, cement that um, used to hold an old air handling unit. So just getting that off of the roof while they're up there. Um, the second ball, let me try to explain this without my blood pressure getting too high. The, um, in 2001, or 2021, we had a comptroller audit. In 2022, um, the comptroller released that audit. There were some recommendations in the report that uh, required us to have a corrective action plan. So we did. Um, fast forward to 2023 here, at the end of the year, the state education department has asked us to change the date on our corrective action plan uh, in accordance with commissioner's regulations that indicate that the corrective action plan needs to be after the comptroller releases their report which of course runs contrary to the fact that the comptroller requires us to respond to the report before it's released. Um, so after much uh, phone conversation with the fine folks at the state education department, they acknowledge that this is a, you know, uh, a conflict between two different agencies in the state <clears throat> and they have to work on it. But in order to move forward, they did ask us to formalize this somehow. Uh, I pointed out that the last six audits that were released on the website 
are all the same. They said they're going through, they're notifying schools of this. Um, so there's no changes to the corrective action plan. All of it's actually been implemented to this point. Um, it's just the need to have the board update the date on that corrective action plan. Uh, we have to approve our annual reserve plan, so we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then, um, by law, the Board of Education needs to be furnished with the levy collection report. <clears throat> so we're into December, the levy collection is over. Um, the full tax spreadsheet's available in your packet. Uh, we collected 98% of the levy uh, this fall, which is a little bit higher than average. We're usually kind of around 96% but that last 2% will now get turned over to the towns and county to be relevied uh, in the spring. Uh, and then we will review further our 2024 and 25 budget goals, guidelines, and factors. So the first um, thing I wanna talk about, it's the full report is in your, your packet tonight. Um, it's publicly available on board docs if any um, you know, community members are interested in taking a look at it. <coughs> this is a newer requirement from the state. I think we're in the fourth or fifth year where we've had to have this report. Um, it came about because a lot of school districts were getting criticized by the comptroller for not having more thoughtful reserve plans and more intentionality around um, those reserve funds. Um, so what the report does is go through all the different uh, reserves that we have, the legal basis for them, what our plans are for them, the balances for the past five years, and then kind of management analysis of each. Um, so I'm not going to walk through the entire report tonight. It's lengthy, and like I said, it's available in your packet. But I did just want to highlight um, reserve balances for year-end 2022-23. So this was June 30th. So there's no changes relative to the audit report that we received back in October. Uh, we ended the 23 school year around $30 million in reserve funds. Um, that was down from the 21 year because we utilized money for the capital project. But in the last two years, we've been able to put a few um, more dollars in those reserves as we build those back up. Here are all of the reserves that we currently have authorized uh, and the corresponding balances. Um, again, we talk in detail about all of these and the strategies behind them, um, but the one that I want to point out, or two that I want to point out, uh, the TRS retirement contribution, that's the one that was um, authorized by the state four years ago, and we're only allowed to fund that for five years. So this upcoming June 30th will be um, the last time we're able to put more funds into that, and then it'll be technically full. And the 2017 capital reserve for bus purchases is full. So that was a 10-year authorization, um, but we can't put any more money into it. So come this May's vote, um, we're going to need the community to authorize a new capital reserve for, for bus purchases. Um, so we're also going to be continuing our bus replacement plan come May. So we'll have four ballot uh, propositions come May. We'll have the general fund election, we'll have bus purchases, we'll have the establishment of a new capital reserve for buses, and then the board election. Um, so again, just a little over $30 million. Um, for a district of our size, that's a pretty good place to be. I know I've said it before, but there's no recommendations from the state about how much money you should have. It's, it's considered a, a local decision by the Board of Education. Um, but typically, if you see somewhere between 20, 30%, um, that's considered about average. So that's kind of really, really where this puts us. Um, so again, that reserve plan does require um, board approval tonight. So if you have any further questions on that, I'd be happy to answer them. I want to jump into the 24-25 budget goals. Um, so it always seems a little bit abstract to be talking about 24-25 when we're still in 23. Um, but sure enough, it'll be 24 here in a couple weeks. Um, so this is kind of the first uh, conversation around budget development before we get really into um, the, the numbers come spring. So the, this document isn't uh, radically changed from prior years. Um, most of the goals are still the same. Uh, we still have alignment with the Board of Education's goals around academic achievement, partnerships within the community, and fiscal responsibility. We, of course, are going to have all of our legal compliance, so federal, state, local, board laws, uh, regulations. Um, we always incorporate long-range thinking. Um, sometimes it can be tempting to just think about the next six months, 12 months, 18 months, but we're always thinking about uh, the sustainability of programs and if you know, we do implement anything new, the last thing we want is to, in two years, have to back away from something like that. So we always try to think thoughtfully and try to look at a three to five year window. 
Um, one of the things that we added this year from the equity long range plan was an explicit call out in the collective commitments in that document to ensure that we're looking at uh, an equity lens in all of our resource allocation, including um, dollars. And then in the last couple of years, we've made big investments in our technology infrastructure. So our one-to-one -one program, our cybersecurity, all of the instructional programs that we have there, um, and we want to maintain that investment. Then we move over to the guidelines. This is a little bit more of the, the how of the budget process. Um, so we'll talk about enrollment here in a moment, but one of the things we're always taking a look at is student to adult ratios um, to ensure across the K-12 spectrum that they're appropriate um, and that we're gonna maintain staffing wherever appropriate, where, wherever we can. Uh, we have uh, continued commitment to professional learning investments um, for our faculty. Uh, we've moved in the last couple years to a student-based budgeting methodology for materials and supplies, textbooks, software, hardware, and library resources. So that's based on individual school populations as opposed to just kind of like a linear 2% per building per year. Um, <coughs> again, sort of with equity in mind. Uh, in the last couple years, we've really focused on BOCES partnerships to leverage that BOCES aid uh, where available. So that's something we're always taking a look at. Operations, so our food service, transportation, facilities group will always um, and continue to balance efficiencies with service. And then as is typical, extra budget requests, new programs, new initiatives um, are evaluated by the, the senior cabinet team um, before being incorporated into the budget. So as I mentioned, the most important thing, um, obviously for the budget development process is trying to project out enrollment. Uh, so this is the last 10 years or so in red. Um, the current year, 23-24, on Beds Day, so that's the first Wednesday in October, put us at 4,614 students. Our projection for this school year was 4,615. So maybe in the history of my career, I don't want to jinx myself, but I'm not going to probably get much closer than that. Uh, we were just one, one kiddo off, and actually since then, I think we've added um, another seven or eight in the last two months. Um, so it's a little bit... Closer to where we were last year at that 4630 number. So the thing here, uh, two trends I want you to be aware of. We fully recouped all the students that had decided to seek other programming in the COVID year. Uh, 2021, we're back to where we were in 2019, 2020. Uh, and then you can see kind of the projection for the next couple of years actually is trending up a little bit. Um, so this is, as I've mentioned the last couple of years, atypical for the region. Most schools are seeing declining enrollment. Um, we're not necessarily seeing greater birth rates um, in the county. In fact, this year in the enrollment report that I gave you tonight uh, is the lowest Monroe County birth rate since we were tracking that information uh, for six or seven decades or something like that. But what we are finding is that as a percentage of county births, uh, Penfield's enrollment is higher. So they might not be being born here in Penfield Central School District, but by the time they start kindergarten or even pre-K now, they, they seem to be moving here. We also um, have a lot of development in the community happening, which is for some um, school districts that are more landlocked in the region, they're just not seeing that. So that's positive. Uh, that's, that's a great thing for us. Um, next year, and it's in detail in the report, we are seeing kind of like a bubble cohort for kindergarten. Um, the 2018 year had a high birth rate, kind of like a, a little bubble. So we're expecting a little bit of a bump in our kindergarten enrollment. But in general, we kind of are in that 4,700 range uh, over the next five years. So we take a look at this annually. It's not gospel. Uh, it's just a forecast. It's just a model, but it's proven accurate over the years. Um, so that's, that's where we start with the budget process. Another huge factor for our budget uh, are health insurance premiums. Um, so aside from salaries, health insurance premiums are our, our biggest cost. Um, so if you don't know, we participate in a regional consortium. It's called the Rochester Area School Health Plan, RASH-P. I always love that a health plan has RASH as the uh, acronym. Um, that's my sense of humor. Um, the rates for next calendar year, 2024, are increasing 7.5%. Still a lot of money, but um, relative to what we're seeing in other regional and national trends, it's actually less. So there's been a, a little bit of like a bullwhip effect in healthcare costs since uh, the pandemic where you know, healthcare providers need to negotiate with insurance companies, but it's usually on a delayed basis. So you had all of these uh, hospital networks seeing increased costs for supply chains and nursing services, things like that. 
So it's a little bit of a uh, delayed effect in how it actually gets borne out in the cost. Uh, but for us, the plan is um, only at 7.5% next year. Still, you know, a considerable increase, um, but, you know, some of our neighbors are seeing 10%, 11%, 12%, so relatively good place to be. Um, again, this year, like in 2023, there are no uh, changes to our dental rates, um, so that continues to perform uh, where we expect it to, to the point where we didn't need to raise rates. <clears throat> and then we are going to see some significant savings uh, in Medicare next year, so our over 65 population, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So uh, historically, our over 65 population, um, these are the folks that move on to the Medicare plans, those are federally subsidized plans. Uh, these uh, retirees, um, their health care wasn't managed by the RASH group, the RASH consortium. They were just put into a community-rated pool, so they didn't really get favorable rates. Um, new entrants to the market in the last couple of years, uh, we started to see rates coming down, uh, new, uh, new folks stepping in to these Medicare Advantage plans. You probably see commercials and billboards, things like that sometimes about these Medicare Advantage plans. But it allowed the board uh, of directors for RASH to take a look at um, bringing those plans like our under 65 plans under a governance structure and having a little bit more of a buying power by going out with an RFP. Uh, so we did do an RFP uh, this past year um, and we did award the RFP to uh, a Medicare Advantage provider. The results were significant cost savings um, with better benefits. Um, so it's a really a positive thing. So we have about <coughs> four or 500 retirees that are still eligible for health services that you know, have served uh, our district over the years. About 75%, 80% are moving over to the new plan. And now, you know, the next the other, um, quarter or a fifth are staying on the old plan. I should mention that the old plan is seeing a rate increase of about 20% next year, as opposed to these new plans being half the cost. Uh, but there were some folks that, you know, you know, healthcare is an emotional decision. They didn't want to, you know, necessarily fix something that wasn't broke. Um, so it will be something, another opportunity going into the 2025 year, uh, whether or not we can move some more folks over. Uh, but it was a really worthwhile initiative um, for not just Penfield, but all the local school districts in the area. Um, I know it's been talked about a little bit at Monroe County School Boards, but I wanted to at least uh, acknowledge it publicly because it'll be going into effect here in the next couple weeks. Another big cost, um, you know, from a macro level in our budget are the employer contribution rates to the two New York State pension <coughs> systems. Um, so the first of which is the ERS system, employer retirement system. So this is traditionally for our non-instructional folks, our, um, our staff. The contribution rates for next year for that group are increasing substantially. So from 13.1% um, of payroll to 15.2%. So that's a 16% year over year increase. Uh, and this is the first time in the tax cap era since 2011 that the year-over-year uh, -year change is more than 200 basis points, so more than two full percentage points. And it'll be interesting because tax cap law, and we'll review our tax cap um, next month, actually allows a exclusion so that if there's this increase more than those 200 basis points, you can actually levy for it. So that's never happened um, in the last you know, 12 years, so it'll be interesting to see exactly how that works from the state level <clears throat> because we'd be the ones telling them how much it's gonna cost. So it, you know, there's no check on exactly what that would look like. So we'll, we'll talk about that much more um, at the end of January, but just wanted to point that out. On the teacher's retirement system side, the TRS system, a um, little bit more of a favorable number. So this current year contribution rate is 9.76%. Uh, and they've indicated that next year's rate will be between 9.75 or 10.25 percent. They don't finalize their rates typically until the first week of February or so. Um, so I'll come back once that's actually finalized, but you know, better news on the TRS side for sure. And then just on the other side of the, the budget ledger, um, kind of just thinking about revenue. So the November CPI report was released this morning. It was over three again. Um, so come January, when the December CPI uh, report um, comes out, we'll understand the 2023 calendar year CPI, Consumer Price Index, measure of inflation. Uh, it will be over 2%, so that's one of those factors in the tax cap calculation. 
Um, so between that 2%, uh, the property growth that we've seen, which is about 1% of our total assessment in the state's eyes, uh, and then changes <coughs> in pilots, our tax cap formula is going to be over 4%. Um, whether or not we'll actually need that remains to be seen, um, but it's going to be a substantial number relative to what we've seen in the past when inflation was lower and growth was lower. Um, so again, we'll review the full tax cap in detail, every calculation, um, you know, in six weeks or so, but um, just making the board aware of that. And then the other big funding mechanism from the state is education aid. Um, so we're not expecting a shift away from the foundation aid formula. If you recall this past year, it was the third year of the phase in, everybody in the state technically is now on foundation aid um, the way they should be. 400 or so school districts are technically overfunded. So it'll be a question to see whether or not they get more funding or if funding is taken away now that they're on formula. That'll be an interesting dynamic. Um, the state is projecting an overall budget shortfall, but they have also indicated on the education side that they don't anticipate any cuts and that they're going to fund education at an inflationary level, um, whatever that means. And then I do have on there just to note, uh, 2024 is an election year. Um, so traditionally, we see less of a fight around education funding uh, and the advocacy there um, in those years. So much more to come on budget. These are just kind of the things that we know, you know, moving into the budget development season. Requests are currently out to all of our buildings. They're all formulating all their budget requests. We go through those over the holidays. Um, so, so much, much more to come on those. And with that, I turn it over for any questions. Board members, questions or comments? One quick question. Sure. Do you have a sense, you talked about the Penfield um, being a little bit of an outlier in, in the sense that we're growing. Yeah. Do you have a sense of why? We're good. Yeah. <laughs> we're good. I, I think like um, why people are moving here. I, I, I haven't realized that there were new businesses he, here or anything that would draw people. Yeah, I don't know if it's, um, yeah, we, we've had new developments. In the past couple of years, we've had hundreds of single family lots developed. Um, so obviously that's different. You look at like a Brighton or a West Ronico or an East Ronico where there's just no land to develop. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, maybe, or, like Mark said, um, we've become a destination district. You know, I'd like to think that. I think we'd all like to think that. I don't have that in hard data. Um, but if there aren't jobs, you wouldn't move here. So I guess that's what I'm getting at. It's like, what? It, um, yeah. There's available housing. Here. There's available housing, but you have to have a job to pay for the house. Yeah, so sure. I guess we're a classic bedroom community. Yeah. Right? Okay. So they might, they might not it, yeah, it's people, they may not be changing jobs, or they may just be moving to a different part of the of the county. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's what I was thinking. Okay, so it's yeah. not necessarily that they're getting a new job; they could already have a job in mm -hmm. some other town, yeah. Yeah. but right. they want to move to Penfield. Mm -hmm. Especially people with the new families and growing families, they might yeah. decide to move out here. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the growing family thing. You know, you might have one child have your starter home maybe in the city or someplace mm -hmm. else, and just in a smaller community or smaller home, and then mm -hmm. if you want a larger home, that's what the developers are developing, you yeah. know, three to four bedroom homes, mostly four. So yeah. I, I would think it's the availability of that as well. And I know, like, I have friends that are, like, starting to have children, and a lot are, like, we want to move to Penfield because of the schools mm -hmm. when our kids, mm -hmm. like, yeah. they're, they mm -hmm. work in the county, but... I see. They want to be in Penfield for the schools for their kids. I've had a lot of people tell me that. So it really is that we're good. It is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, can, I can share again. <clears throat> Dr. Driffel mentioned we don't have the data point, but in terms of um, uh, some of our large, the local large corporations that build hundreds of homes <clears throat> have really worked and continue to talk about wanting to build in Penfield. So even in areas where it, we border other towns, they want their homes in, in Penfield. Um, because they can sell them. So mm -hmm. it, it's, I think, a lot there. I can speak as well as I know now a number of families in the neighborhood I'm in who their kids have grown, <clears throat> and so they jumped on the market and sold their house mm -hmm. and moved to apartments or condos, you know, downsized. Mm -hmm. and, and those houses, you know, turned over really quickly with 
um, brand new families or future families, mm -hmm. young, young couples. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, you put all those in, but the, the homes I know don't, as we all know, and I'm sure that's everywhere, but um, they're building quite a lot in, in the um, surrounding areas, still Penfield, but not necessarily in the hub, but mm -hmm. as you drive out 441 or yeah. um, up on like Plank and Jackson. So, mm -hmm. but I'll stand by the fact, like Mark said, that it's just that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I also just want to, I'm sorry. You no, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to also mention this. It's, it really illustrates the fact that a good school district helps all the community members, not just families, because That's it right. helps, you know, as you talk about, people are, people want to build in our district. It helps our, re, our property values. Mm -hmm. You know, it does help us as a community beyond just being a parent. Yeah. Um, and with that, I do have a, a <laughs> kind of a question, maybe for a future discussion. You know, we did the, the expansion of three of the four elementary schools yet we still see this going up um, and are we looking at I'm not saying looking at, at expanding but are we doing some more analysis on capacity yeah it's one of those things that keeps me up at night um, to be clear like these projection increases aren't super vast right it's 50 mm -hmm. 60 kids across a k-12 so k-6 that might just be 50 kids you know, and across four different buildings, that might only be a couple kids per grade. So it's not enough to, you know, institute a new whole class or something like that. So we currently have ample spaces is, but it's definitely something that we're always considering taking a look at. I think as we continue those conversations too, is, is where um, we don't have room for right now currently is, is UPK. And so, you know, that's relatively new for us. We're in our second year of offering UPK um, and trying to find those spaces is tough. Um, there are a number of districts because of declining enrollment, they're finding ways to pull UPK into their existing buildings. But even with the additions project from a few years ago at three of our elementary schools, they're still not um, empty classrooms um, for for bringing in multiple UPK classes. We're playing around with that, well, more to come, but um, that's an area where schools that are seeing declining enrollment are really jumping on because they're able to mm -hmm. continue to utilize and bring from um, community partners into uh, the school setting. As you mentioned, this, this growing doesn't even take into account <coughs> uh, any UPK uh, headcount. Correct, mm -hmm. yeah, this is just K-12. I have a question. Have you seen um, with enrollment kind of us getting back those students who have left, have you noticed any buildings um, where there are more students that have just come in where maybe their class sizes might increase a little bit? Uh, Harris Hills rebounded a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's still the lowest population amongst the four schools, but it's not as low as it was. Um, you, know, it's, you can kind of tease out from the the enrollment report that I gave, um, like the homeschool numbers are down a little bit. So some kids uh, just homeschooled during the pandemic. Some went into a non-public setting, like a private school. Those numbers have kind of come back down a little bit to a more historic level. Um, so to answer your question, they're all pretty similar. It's got hair cells up a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? All right. That uh, concludes superintendent <laughs> reports. <laughs> okay, we are on public comments. So we have one. Um, we have Mr. Robert Reed. Would you like to come up? So if you could just state your name. Yeah, do I sit down? Is yes, you can sit down. Down. yes, you can sit down. Yes, you can. Please do. Please do. Please do. All people feel, feel a little bit naked. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, Bob Reed, uh, 275 Parkview Drive out there on the far western frontier of Penfield, <laughs> facing Brighton. Um, <clears throat> I'm here to talk about the possible sale of uh, the property on Atlantic Avenue, but I realized I'd never spoken to the Board of Education before, and all four of our kids were in, uh, in Penfield. One graduated from the Creekside School at BOCES. Uh, the other three 
uh, went on to uh, get uh, undergraduate degrees and graduate degrees. And uh, we're very grateful for the, the role that Penfield uh, played in their, their educational lives. Um, and uh, so <clears throat> thank you all for the time. You weren't here when that was happening. <laughs> I can't, but you're the custodians, you're the stewards, you are the, uh, the caretakers of the system that, that helped our kids a great deal. Um, <clears throat> so the Atlantic Avenue property, a green jewel uh, sitting out there. I don't know how long the district has owned it, but uh, uh, I, I would hope that you would not be in a hurry to divest uh, the town of this property and the people of the town and the future of the town of this property. Um, uh, not so long ago we saw a large maybe eight or nine acre parcel on Creek Street acquired by a local developer, <clears throat> mature forest and totally flattened, uh, roots pulled out, bedrock blasted just so they could put a dozen houses in in that area. And I'm not against houses, more students for the schools, but we have a lot of developable land in Penfield. It's open. And it just seems at this stage of our raising consciousness about the environment, to lose a mature forested area to development, uh, I think is a tragedy, especially when there is land for development. We have land for development. Uh, I, I could imagine uh, Penfield High School biology students uh, engaged in projects in that property that abuts Hip Brook Preserve and is quite near the Thousand Acre Swamp. Uh, I, I imagine that it's useful for purifying the air and supporting uh, uh, plants and animal species. I'm a bit of a tree hugger, I'm sorry. But uh, I hope you'll really give due consideration before you let that go in a hurry. This is Christmas time. People's attention is scattered. I'm not sure how many people even know that this, this could happen very soon. And once it's lost, you can't get it back. So I would urge you to take your time. Uh, I know you'll do due diligence. Uh, it could be a short-term gain in money for the district, but what's the long-term in losing a, an environmentally sensitive piece of land? So uh, that's it. If I have uh, <clears throat> maybe a little, tiny bit of my three minutes left, I want to comment on how important the uh, uh, foreign travel was for my kids at Penfield High School in the language department my girls went to Spain and France. <clears throat> and in the senior year, uh, and, and my son uh, went to Germany. He was in, there was something called the Penfield Passau Exchange at that time. I don't think it exists anymore. Students from Passau, Germany came. My time's up, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Trap door's gonna open. <laughs> anyway, they benefited enormously from form travel. They came back different kids. Uh, and uh, it, it charged them for the future and helped them identify things that they wanted to do. Anyway, again, thank you very much for your time. Thank, thank, you. thank you for coming. Okay, we are on the PHS course description guide 6A. Can I please have a motion and a second that the 2024-25 Penfield High School Course Description Guide be approved as presented on November 28, 2023? So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed? Can I have a motion and a second that the change orders as described above um, in the packet be approved? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor? All in favor, none opposed? Can I have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approve the 2023-24 property tax collection status, including all additions and cancellations made to the original approved levy amount? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Um, can I have a motion and second that the Board of Education approves the annual reserve plan and the presented recommendation and directs that the recommendations for reserve, oh, excuse me, for reserve use be incorporated into the 2024-25 uh, budget planning process? So moved. Second. All those in favor? 
All in favor, none opposed. Can I have a motion and a second that the board uh, reapprove the corrective action plan for the 2022 state comptroller report? So moved. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Um, can I have a motion and a second that the board recertify the Medicaid compliance plan as presented? So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed. Um, policies for second read. Can I have a motion and a second that the Board of Education approves the policies as presented, um, which is corporal punishment and the use of timeout and physical restraints that we talked about, um, was it? Two weeks last, ago. Last yeah, last meeting. meeting. So moved. Second. Questions or comments? Okay. okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Sorry. <laughs> All in favor, none opposed? And then Monroe County School Board Association Committee meetings. Legislative, Nicole? Yes. Um, this meeting was mostly to talk about um, a Zoom with legislators that happened yesterday, but mm -hmm. it was to plan for that Zoom. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just to really agree on how they were going to use the time that they had with the legislators. Um, so that that was interesting, um, but I, something that they also talked about, tacked on at the end, was um, certain position papers that Monroe County has on different issues. And I found some of those papers um, pretty interesting. One was about um, appealing for, <coughs> making the case for free school school lunches that you know mm -hmm. we've talked about before but just um talking about how s student achievement is higher when when lunches are provided for free and also as we know from our <laughs> district that school meal debt has increased across the board so um you know it's just interesting that this keeps sort of like the buses <laughs> this keeps coming up mm -hmm. and, it'll, and it'll be interesting to know how it lands um, and then another position paper that they talked about was um, minimum wage increasing to $15 an hour on January 1st and how um, how schools, Dan, you could correct me if I'm getting this wrong, but um, how schools need to um, raise funds to deal with that wage increase for, is that true? We're dealing with that here? Yeah. yeah. Um, we made the move a year ago to mm -hmm. put everybody at 15, okay. so we're a little bit ahead of the curve, but mm -hmm. yeah, no question. It, it's um, particularly on a percentage basis, if it's moving from $14.20 to $15, it's 80%, mm -hmm. or not 80%, but it's a significant raise increase mm -hmm. um, for some districts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how to meet that um, extra expense. And then and then the last position paper I found interesting was um, about the, the teacher shortage, and they talked about different reasons why that is the case and things like um, increased certification requirements, um, constraints on competitive salaries, um, mm -hmm. uh, and also years of negative messaging about public schools. <laughs> um, and so people don't want to go into education when there's all this negative messaging and um, some possible uh, ways to mitigate those things. Um, one is uh, loan forgive uh, student loan forgiveness program. Um, it's hard to say yes to a, the wages when you're going to be graduating with <laughs> big debt. That's like a double whammy. So if you could get rid of at least one of those uh, uh, loan forgiveness program. Um, another one was allowing real world experiences to be applied towards the certification <laughs> process. Um, so if you, maybe if you started in an this is your second career. Some of that first career experience could be um, applied. Um, and um, incentives to enter the field, like 
higher wages and, and like higher wages and also the opposite of the negative messaging, but um, sort of a return to, I, I'm not sure if it's a return to it because I'm not sure if our country has ever been great at it, but just a perception that teaching is a noble and highly mm -hmm. skilled profession. Um, Perhaps we were better at it in the past, but I don't think that's ever been a strong suit. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I thought those were interesting. Great. So, I, I'm, you know, I know in the past when I was in legislative, we talked about it, and I don't know if it's in the current um, white paper. But the other, th <coughs> other avenue is trying to streamline the uh, teachers coming from out of state and mm -hmm. getting them certified. Yeah. Because there's a lot of states that aren't real friendly to their teachers and if we could make it more welcoming for them to come that could solve a, you know that could help with that shortage problem but it the, the state um, certification process for out-of-state is pretty onerous and, and, mm -hmm. and you guys could speak to it more specifically but you know that's not helping any. Mm -hmm. Nicole I'm just wondering was anything mentioned about tier six? I know there's a lot of. Actually. So I was going to come to remind me what that is because maybe. So, <laughs> so <laughs> go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, all you. So it came up yesterday, sort of transitioning um, in both. I went to both advocacy Zooms yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, the nine and three. And in both, um, when we talk about teachers, um, it, uh, they really hit with what maybe our legislators have some control over, which is the tier. And so when you join, when you work for a public organization, whether it be the working in Albany, working for the county, working for our schools, regardless of, of what you're, you're in, whether you're a teacher, administrator, teaching assistant, clerical, you're, you're in a tier, which is really like your retirement tier. And um, we're now up to tier six. And so what that means is new people coming in pay, th they will pay for their entire career into the teacher retirement system. Where tier three and four paid for the first 10 years, um, a straight percentage, and then don't pay into the retirement system anymore. The district continues to pay in for, for you. Um, and so and that was one of those big pieces, like tier six is making it harder and harder. So it used to be at least the belief that we know that as a teacher uh, starting uh, 25 years ago, I, I knew my salary was gonna be lower, but then the benefits along the way, you know, in terms of healthcare, insurance benefits, a retirement piece, but tier six also pushes the retirement age further past. I think it's 62, 63. 63, now. 63. So like those pieces of being able to retire at 55 and then mm -hmm. tier six is 63. It starts to really feel like I think some of the, the negative pieces mm -hmm. around young people wanting to go into teaching. It mm -hmm. still is a noble profession. It still is one of those um, uh, a lot of unsung heroes in mm -hmm. terms of the work you do that you don't see every day. Mm -hmm. Social media, media, news uh, all sometimes make it look like a, a negative thing when we have incredible people in our classrooms uh, working every single day mm -hmm. but the tier piece is we're at tier six what is tier seven going to look like what's tier eight going to look like mm -hmm. um, because ultimately our, our educators are um, are required in New York State to have a master's degree so we're talking about at least six years of of post high school education not including all of the CTLE hours they have to have to maintain their certifications it's a lot um, and that's where um, we really pushed through advocacy around around trying to look at those tiers and what we can do to, to support. I mean, tier one, there's there's not many of them left um, probably working, but that was when you retire, your, your pension was 100% of your final average salary, mm -hmm. and they paid much less in. And that was, you know, that was years ago, but mm -hmm. um, tier six has really turned a lot of people off from education that I know of because mm -hmm. they look at how much they're paying in and what the retirement age is going to be and um, it's different than someone teaching across the hallway who might have started five years before them who's in tier four. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what's true because tier five and six came pretty pretty quick yes. back to back. So you're paying into it for if, you, if you're working for 25 years you're paying into it for the full 25 years. Yep, yep. Yeah. and then it increases how much you pay it increases with your salary. And so it's the not amount a straight. Of your pension is significantly less 
Oh, it's not. It's not even a hundred percent anymore. Oh, oh no! no. Oh, no. It's that, not. Sorry. That was only tier, tier four. One. Tier four. That was only tier one. Tier oh. four is uh, sixty percent oh. of a calculation they do of your final average years. Mm. Tier six, um, I think, is twenty-three percent, maybe. Yeah. So I know, like, I have colleagues that are, you know, thirty, and they're like, "Yeah, we're not doing this past forty. So, like, that's my fear as an educator mm -hmm. is. These people aren't good. We're going to lose 10 to 15 years of really strong teachers because yeah. I know, like, I'm way better now after 23 years than I was 20 years ago. Oh, yeah. And we're going to lose that experience. We're going to lose those mentors. And then we're really going to be in a crisis. <coughs> that's my biggest fear. Is and that's unique at. to education, right? Like, I'm thinking of um, a public defender that I know who, who said that he'll get 100% of his highest salary and I think it's the same thing with the police departments. And so in terms of other state uh, uh, employees. I know the tier system is. Police is different. Yeah, but the ERS <coughs> system, like I talked about before, so that'd be like our facilities folks, um, other public officials that work for villages, counties, municipalities, they're on tier six as well. So it's a very similar structure to TRS, which is a similar problem because like Dr. Putnam mentioned, it used to be a great recruiting tool um, mm -hmm. and now younger folks are seeing it as less of a, a benefit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm. But that was one, so to piggyback on that, I'm, I'm thank you to, to Kristen who brought that up too, is I had written that down, is that piece in terms of when we look at the, the public image of schools and starting salaries, our, our legislators can, can champion things, but they can't, they don't have any power necessarily over, over that. Right. Um, but they do when it comes to the, the tier system and where we're going with it. Mm -hmm. um, it is, I, I, you know, I'm sure we all, educators know of folks who, who have, I know many who have education degrees and once they saw the tier six come into play, it, that it wasn't worth it anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's very, very concerning. Mm -hmm. yes. So that's just changing legislation to change that. I'm yeah, I think it would be a tough one, like everything in government, because it would be, what do you do? Same with minimum wage. So it's one thing to say we're moving to 15, mm -hmm. but what about the people who are making 1550? Like we've got to do, we've got to make sure if we're doing it fair is looking at everybody. So mm -hmm. um, that compression is in there. Same with what do you do with the people who are on tier five and tier six, you're going, are you going back in to say, we're, we're changing that completely and we're going to make all the tier sixes, tier fours, then it's how much should I pay in? My percentage is different than what I would have been tier four. These are above my pay grade for a statewide system on how to, on how to fix that. But, mm. um, that was a lot of the conversation. Mm. And, and again, that, that retirement age, which again, it's one of those perks. I know it's probably, um, you know, I, I, I didn't come from a family of, of educators. Um, and so um, it's a difficult conversation, but you know, there is, that's the reality is it, it is a, for the amount of education you need to be an educator, it is typically a lower pay than the private sector. Mm -hmm. But the public sector means that during re recession times, you're typically safe during the insurance piece, you know, in terms of what a private sector pays for their insurance versus a public school employee. Ch you know, there's those perks, that are there and you don't see them up front, but they really are to attract great teachers and keep great teachers. But as those tiers change and say all of a sudden, it's not 55, it's 63, it's not 50 to 60% for your pension, but it's 20% for your pension. All of a sudden, those long term, you start thinking maybe at 22, it's fine because you're not thinking when you're 22 about being 63. <laughs> um, but when it starts to, to, to sort of sink in, it, it's a concern. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. How often are the tears uh, changed and like how do they move up and who determines that? Is it like every few years? Like there's no, like, tier three, four was around, like, they always put tier three and four together because they're, I think, because Pretty, yeah. they're so similar. Yeah. So similar. Like and, five and six, yeah. And they were there for a long time, and then five and six came. So there's no, like, timeline. I looked at Dan, he'll hit me if I'm wrong, but, like, there's no timeline of when they change that. Mm -hmm. it, it is done in, in when all they want of you, though. To. What's that? When they want to. When yes. They, and mm -hmm. who's they? <laughs> Other state workers who don't have tears. Well, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> the prior That's prior exactly tiers. right. I, yeah, a lot of it is. Where, where does the money come from? So, you know, yep. like, who's paying it and where does it come from? 
And the, I, you know, I can speak for the tier five uh, really was led by um, former Governor Cuomo mm -hmm. around pensions and what his salary was and what his pension, like there was a piece there and same with our APPR evaluation system, which he uh, tied to test scores. So there were some things there that, so the governor had a lot of pull at, at that time. So it really is Albany that makes those decisions. And I'm sure they are watching, but I'll say that many times Albany will make decisions that they refer to as budget neutral for them, but it has an impact on local communities. And um, again, that tier piece probably made a lot of <laughs> sense if you aren't talking to the employees who are in those tiers and what it means to education. And we didn't see that immediately with tier six or tier five. We didn't see immediately teachers, you know, individuals saying I'm not teaching anymore, but as they get into it, and especially as you talk about working across the hall from somebody in tier four um, and, and you're looking at your potential future in mm -hmm. a career, um, it's easier to step away when that's why about five years is when across the state and, and nation that five years is where te we start to lose a lot of teachers, people who leave the profession of teaching. And that's not just Penfield or, or New York, that's a, a national uh, trend. Okay, thank you. Yep. Mm. They also talked about um, like CTE yeah. teachers and, and finding teachers and across the state in different areas, some of the starting salaries for CTE is like $40,000. So finding a way to Those are a lot of our get BOCES. and keep teachers, yep. yeah. Like our BOCES <laughs> career technical education, mm -hmm. I think they're, the aid is capped at 30000 I want to say yeah. in terms of trying to, to try to bring that up. And I know um, Nicole mentioned the legislative talking about u utilizing your sort of real world experience mm -hmm. towards your teaching degree. Mm -hmm. and, and we've continued to advocate, especially around our career technical mm -hmm. education. You know, our teachers teaching welding to our students at EMCC. Like, yes, having that teaching degree is great, but like if you're like a 20 year welder that, mm -hmm. you know, how do we fast track you to get you into those, um, yes. those careers? Add a competitive at a competitive pay. pay. Right. Yeah. It's yep. crazy. I, I would just add the, the advocacy was really interesting and because the 9 a.m. had more of the legislators that we typically see around here. But because we're such a large group with Monroe County School Boards and like you think about like HFL, um, you know, you get in and out um, further in uh, west um, of us, um, you get some more reps who also have a lot of rural communities. And so it's very interesting. Um, everything around electric buses, we have talked about as a board, as a community, we've heard from community members, but like in the morning session, it was legislators saying like, yeah, the timeline we gotta work on, but this is good, this is great. And then the afternoon it was like, this isn't gonna work because of the uh, far North country and the large districts. And so it was just interesting that legislators, you know, who are all working, you know, for a common goal, I have very different views of things. Mm -hmm. um, the foundation aid came up as Dr. Driffle did a nice job referencing is that foundation aid has been talked about as that formula being um, uh, around for a long time. And uh, um, some districts feel like if you redid the foundation aid from scratch that they should be getting more money from the state. But then does that mean another district gets less money from the state? And like, how does that work? How can you, how can you shift foundation aid and do it in a, in a fair, equitable manner? School lunches came up. They did, a number of legislators did um, sort of um, tap themselves for um, the changes that there are schools that are able to now provide free and reduced lunch because they lowered the, um, threshold for, for free and re reduced. Penfield is not impacted by that. But then in some districts, it's like one school has free and reduced lunch and another school doesn't. So they're just talking about the inequity still. Um, they're still, that is a large advocacy area that every legislator talked about um, um, supporting. Um, and then the, uh, the tax cap, which, <coughs> I think I'm in my 10th year, and so I look at Mark and Catherine, you know, and when, when the tax cap came into play, and um, we've advocated, but the legislators made it really clear, like, the tax cap is popular across the state, and it's not going away, but I don't think Mineral County School Boards Association or anybody who was on it is asking to, like, just throw the tax cap out, but making sure that we look at it to say what can be put in under the cap, what can be, how do we, how's the formula work, making sure that 
that um, districts um, are able to to remain funded because that concern is if there's not funding then the potential piece is staff you know 75 percent is is staff when we look at our, our budgets and um, you know that impact um, on a greater community because our teachers and educators live within the community and and their paychecks go back into the community so it has that sort of um, long-reaching impact but I, I think the advocacy um, and, and Emily was on with me in the afternoon. I, I thought it was uh, informative, insightful. They definitely listened. The legislators have been have been briefed. It was. I didn't think there was anybody from the many that were on that, you know, weren't able to talk through and hear and understand, um, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, uh, facilities committee. So. You know, no, right. you're you're prepared, and I'm not. So why don't you <laughs> well, take this it? is a relative thing. Okay. <laughs> it was a good meeting. How's that? It was a very good meeting. It was a good meeting. It was a good meeting. Uh, so this, so Catherine and I attended the facilities uh, committee meeting, where we really received a pretty good update on the state of the buildings and grounds and transportation center construction, as well as mm -hmm. the the upcoming phases, which include things like the commons. Um, Harris, Harris Hill, I think, is the, yeah, um, the best vestibule best there, mm -hmm. um, and then the library here, and, and, mm -hmm. and a few other things. So, you know, the things are going well, as you know, some things are more expensive than we anticipated, some are less, and, and you know, the, Dr. Driffle and, the, and our architects and our, you know, the people managing the project, they, um, they work through this. I mean, they work a look at, at trying to adjust all these things to make sure that we stay on budget. Um, I think one of the things that did come up, which ties into what Dr. Button was talking about, <clears throat> were some of the setbacks, and one of them was buses, right? So one of the issues we have that's acting as a delay is part of our plan for the bus garage is electric buses. In the long run, how many buses are we going to have? A, a lot. And what kind of electricity demand is that? Well, our and e today can't meet that demand. Now, that's not our demand for today. That's our demand in the future when we're fully converted. Mm -hmm. But because of that, they're not, because they don't have a, I would say they don't have a plan, but they are not comfortable that they have a, that with this, <clears throat> they're causing a delay in some of us run, in allowing us to run conduit, to run electricity for the building just for construction. Uh, is that correct? That I think you've, you're on it. And I would just tell you that, uh, that um, after facilities committee, um, and then I waited until advocacy. So I have reached out to a couple, but I'll give a shout out to our assembly uh, member, Jen Lunsford, who um, it was yesterday that I was in contact with her office. And then today received a phone call directly from RG&E saying, we need, to, we need to get with you to make this happen. So um, um, we have, uh, you know, and I'm, I, I know enough about rg &E power <laughs> that we need over there to be dangerous, you know, like, so I'm not the one to really start talking about where we're doing stuff and where to put the lines. So our um, M&E Engineering, uh, who we work with, is, is reaching out to that contact at rg &E. So hopefully within the next few days, week or so, we will have some, um, um, you know, good news. And it really is just falls in that we need really permanent service like where to put the box in for us to have um to have that electricity to keep building right now we can keep kind of working with temporary power because we're outside once the building goes up and they've got to be inside you you're going to need the electricity um and and so it really has to do with like the substation substation they're going to need to upgrade their substation in order to provide power not just for us but also the large um um, building on 250 in Atlantic, uh, the townhomes and everything, which oh, as a yeah, reminder yeah. is in the Webster School District, mm -hmm. so town of Penfield <laughs> Webster Schools. But, um, you know, so all of those pieces. And so it just, with many bureaucratic red tape pieces, it was sort of, we're not getting the answers and we've been waiting for about eight months working with rg and &E, and um, they've got to follow their very specific process. And, but it, it's a, uh, a kudos, I, I, I believe, for, for Jen Lunsford for that support. Yeah. And, um, and Mark, amazing. you're right. We only have two yes. electric buses now. Right. We don't need that facility to be up and running for 100 electric buses, um, but uh, we do need the, the electricity. And now I look at Dan and say, did, did Mark and I do an okay job explaining yeah. that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I, and I, I think I'm going to just segue a little bit. You know, the, 
the state, you know, the, the um, Governor Hochul and, and Jen and all, uh, all of those folks, you know, they have a, a, a very, you know, an aspiration that I agree with, you know, trying to convert to electric buses. You know, then there's the reality of implementation, which is never simple or straightforward. And honestly, they don't have the details. We you know, Part of what we try to do and others try to do is educate them on the details. Mm -hmm. In the reality, the details come along later, and, and they're not even, we're not even aware of the details. So this is a learning curve. We're, we're kind of at the front end of this whole, let's put electric buses in, because we're building the building. And, you know, it and things like the North Country and other rural areas. So, you know, you can have the aspiration of saying let's go to electric and just because you have problems doesn't mean it's a bad <coughs> idea it means that there's just more things to work through and we'll get there i think that's when you have to really take a good honest look at the timeline right. mm -hmm. but right. you still have to say is this is this a worthwhile goal and, yeah. and and not let the problem stop the goal stop the success you just have to work through the problems and understand it won't go smoothly especially for the people who are at the front of it you know if another school district 10 years later build a bus garage, they won't have a problem. Yeah. Right. But we're at the front. Right. And, and that's just the way it is. It's not good or bad. Um, well, but it the, the, the nuances, <coughs> though, of making one big sweeping requirement mm -hmm. for an entire state that's so diverse, where you have, you know, Mm -hmm. cities that that bustle and then you have the North Country and then you have what we've learned through this is how you know the draining of the battery for cold weather and longer hauls and things like that so when when you when you have the good intention and then you make the legislation and it's like great we did this look at this accomplishment and then all the problems start popping up right yeah. Um, and, but I got to say, uh, for Jen Lunsford, yeah. I, you know, she's an amazing advocate and, um, mm -hmm. I feel confident with that kind of advocacy right. that as things come up, you know, we have that, again, that relationship with our, um, another one of our partners, you know? So, um, but yeah, those big picture moments, if only, you know, if only mm -hmm. we could see more clearly when we make these. Uh, you know, the demand mm -hmm. of, you know, a timeline, a deadline with a good idea, and then mm -hmm. all of these different things that come up. You know, that's New York State. I mean, the reality <laughs> is, is it's been, or it's, is it everywhere? It's, it's, this has been the way it's, this has happened long before buses, right? With other things they've done, they've had yeah. good uh, intentions, mm -hmm. the, imp the implementation kind of lacks the detail that we have to figure out as we go, and it will continue to happen. And we just yeah. have to understand that's the way the state works. My, my thinking around this was when I want my children to do something, I have to say I want it done now. Because if I say, just make sure you clean your room by next weekend, it's not going to get done. Okay. So like that, that's what my positive <coughs> thinking here, which is the state gives us a deadline knowing that maybe that deadline is going to get extended. But if we don't have a deadline, then it'll, people typically will wait. Like, so if it's in 10 years, it'll be like, well, let's wait. Let's, let, let's wait eight years and then we'll start working on it and then we'll say well we only have two years to do it so we're slow but I I really do again I think it says a lot about the district and the board leadership around the fact that we're not diving in a hundred percent we've mm -hmm. got the uh, thanks to the grant that um, uh, um, John Lunsford was able to, mm -hmm. to secure for Penfield we have two electric buses we're you know working on those we're seeing how it goes we're learning yeah. um, and then just so happens we're building a, a bus facility which was planned before the mm -hmm. deadline of electric buses but we're able to shift a bit to at least have that conduit ready to expand when necessary because if you I'm glad it kind of worked out because if we didn't have any of that conduit and systems ready to go, then we're talking about tearing up asphalt to lay right. electric lines. So <coughs> we'll have it in, but um, similar on a much smaller scale to the football lacrosse field we have. Our turf field, we built it with a stadium and put conduit in for lights, but the first time there was no lights. And then after a few years, the, the demand and request from the community was we want lights on the field, and because we had thought um, forward thinking and had the conduit already for the lights we didn't have to mm -hmm. tear up the whole field to put lights in so you know that's that's where we are but um that's that's it so i'm gonna go home and tell my kids to clean their room tonight <laughs> <laughs> let me know how that works but are they in a rural setting or are they more no, okay <laughs> never mind <laughs> a little bit of both yeah right mm -hmm. all right can i ask just a quick question only because harris hill had reached out and was just curious about um their vestibule are are we good on our timeline yeah still to a go for the summer mm -hmm. okay 
And that was one of the, uh, we did talk a little bit at the <coughs> facilities committee is, of course, you know, could we start early? Like, could we start in the spring? And the hard part is because it's that vestibule, the, the whole right. thing would be offline. And so if we want it to be secure, having a huge hole in our um, right. entrance probably isn't the best thing to do when school's in session. So yeah. summertime, um, we're, we're gonna be in a, in a good spot. Perfect, thank you. Yep, on that same token, I'll just mention with Indian Landing, um, we know we've talked about here the classrooms that weren't up and ready uh, uh, <coughs> with some um, unforeseen situations. We've been we've met with um, the uh, uh, George English and um, our uh, uh, folks from campus and SEI um, architecture met with the teachers who had the new classrooms and the delay and the impact. And mm -hmm. uh, I have uh, I wasn't able to make that meeting. I was double booked, but I have been going through the notes from that meeting. Some great points in terms of what we can learn to. Um, for this summer, we've got uh, more rooms to, to get uh, done. Um, and so that feedback was great. And then uh, SEI, Architect, Campus Construction, George English, Marcy Ware, um, I was able to get there for about half of it. They went to each room for the teachers whose classrooms will be impacted this year to kind of go through and, and what are the small changes we can make to make sure that we're um, creating the spaces that are best for our students and um, our teachers. So. Um, we're hoping for a, a much smoother summer this summer with the construction at Indian Landing. Okay, any unfinished business? Nope, any new business? No? Okay, can I have a motion and a second that the meeting be adjourned at 7.51 p.m.? So moved. Second. All those in favor? All in favor, none opposed.